The two brazen pillars at the entrance of King Solomon's Temple represent one of the most enigmatic symbols in Freemasonry, surrounded by a rich tapestry of historical and mythical interpretations. These pillars, often confused with ancient stone pillars mentioned in old Masonic manuscripts, embody a blend of pre-flood knowledge and the architectural influence of Hiram Abiff, drawing from Egyptian temple designs. Despite the myriad legends and various accounts regarding their dimensions and significance, these pillars symbolize the enduring nature of Masonic traditions and teachings. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Few references in Freemasonry are less understood than the two brazen pillars in the porch of King Solomon's temple. Probably a greater mass of misinformation exists regarding these than any other symbol in the craft. Early ritualists confused the mythical pillars of stone, spoken of in almost all of the old charges or manuscript constitutions of the craft, with the brazen pillars of the porch. The result is that modern Freemasons have composite pillars, fusing of the ancient and the mythical pillars on which were supposed to be engraved the arts and sciences of the time before the Flood, and those which Hiram Abiff erected, undoubtedly with Egyptian influence and memories of Egyptian temples to guide him, before the great house of the Lord which Solomon built. The fascinating if wholly legendary, history of the craft, repeated with variations in the majority of the old manuscript rolls, beginning with the Regis of 1390, is older than any Freemasonry we know in practice. The story varies from manuscript to manuscript, but in its essentials is much the same. It was evidently a tradition as strong in its day as is our legend of Hiram. To quote but a few lines bearing on the pillars, consider these lines from the York Manuscript No. 1, written in about A.D. 1600. Before Noah flood, there was a man called Lamech, as is written in the Scriptures, in the chapter of Genesis. And this Lamech had two wives, the one named Ada, by whom he had two sons, the one named Jabal, and the other named Jubal and his other wife was called Zillah, by whom he had one son named Chibulcain, and one daughter named Nama. And these four children founded the beginnings of all the sciences in the world. Viz, Jabal, the oldest son, found out the science of geometry. He was a keeper of flocks and sheep lands in the fields, as is noted in the chapter before said. And his brother Jubal found the science of music. Song of the Tongue, Harp and Organ. And the third brother, Tubalcain, found the science called Smithcraft, of gold, silver, iron, copper and steel. And the daughter found the area of weaving. And these persons, knowing right well that God would take vengeance for sin, either by fire or water, wherefore they writ their several sciences that they had found in two pillars of stone that might be found after Noah, his flood. And the one stone would not burn with fire, and the other called Lettons, because it would not be drowned with water, etc. The word here spelled Lettons is rendered on the other old constitutions as Latins, usually translated brick. But marble does not resist fire. Brick especially early unscientifically vitrified brick, does not resist water. If the word be considered a perversion of Latin, which means brass or bronze, then the ancient legendary pillars are made of metal and marble, a more sensible idea, since metal would resist fire and the marble water. In Tyre was the great temple to Heracles, 
with two pillars, one of gold, the other of smaragdus, polished green marble. Other Tyrian temples to Melkarth had two metal pillars or two monoliths. Modern masonry has hollow pillars to serve as safe repositories for the archives of masonry and to preserve them from flood and fire. In spite of the fact, sacred history says nothing of masonry or the reason for the pillars being hollow. It is reasonable to suppose that the ancient Masonic tradition of Lamech's children and their pillars was confused, as knowledge of the Bible became more common after the invention of printing, with the other brazen pillars of an ancient day, and finally with those of Solomon's temple. How high were the pillars? A question which has agitated American Freemasonry, largely without reason, for many years. A majority of American rituals state that they were 35 cubits in height. A minority hold to 18. One compromises on 30. A few do not give the height at all. Mackey, in his revised Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, says, Immediately within the porch of the temple and on each side of the door were placed two hollow brazen pillars. The height of each was 27 feet and the diameter about 6 feet and the thickness of the brass 3 inches. Above the pillar and covering its upper part to the depth of 9 inches was an oval body or chapiter 7 feet and a half in height. Springing out from the pillar at the junction of the chapiter with it was a row of lotus petals which, first spreading around the chapiter, afterwards gently curved downwards towards the pillar, something like the acanthus leaves on the capital of a Corinthian column. About two-fifths of the distance from the bottom of the chapiter, or just below its most bulging part, a tissue of network was carved, which extended over its whole upper surface. To the bottom of this network were suspended a series of fringes, and on these again were carved two rows of pomegranates, 100 being in each row. This description, it seemed to Dr. Mackey, is the only one that can be reconciled with the various passages which relate to these pillars in the Book of Kings, Chronicles, and Josephus, to give a correct conception of the architecture of these symbols. In 1904, Brother John W. Barry of Iowa, later to become the Grand Master, rendered an exhaustive report to his Grand Lodge on the height of the pillars, proving anew the belief, practically accepted by biblical students, that the 35 dimension is that of both pillars together, the actual height of each being 18 cubits. The confusion arises in the two accounts in Chronicles and Kings. Various explanations have been advanced as to the discrepancy between 35 as the height of each. The missing cubit is explained on the theory that while each pillar from root to summit was 18 cubits, only 17 and one half showed, the rest being hidden in chapiter and base. This explanation apparently began with the Genevan Bible, or the Breaches Bible, in which it, there is a marginal note stating of the pillars, Every one was eighteen cubits long, but half cubit could not be seen, for it was hid in the roundness of the chapiter, and therefore he giveth every one seventeen and a half. To know the actual size of the pillars, it is necessary to, to know the length of a cubit, and here is room for speculation and many authorities. The Abingdon Bible Commentaries says, The common cubit equal to about 18 inches, the longer royal cubit to about 20 and a half inches. John Wellesley Kelchner, whose restorations of King Solomon's Temple are to be found in Masonic Bibles, considers the cubit to be equal to two feet. The Standard Dictionary gives the cubit as the measure of length determined by the average arm from elbow to middle fingertip. The Britannica considers that the temple cubit 
must have been in excess of 25 inches. Canon J. W. Horsley, past Grand Chaplain England, who has studied and written much upon the pillars, give a table of sizes in which the cubit is but 14 and 2 fifths inches. Many rituals set forth the fact that Hiram cast the pillars on the plains of the Jordan in the clay ground between Succoth and Zarthan, or Zeredetha. Both 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles are authority for this statement. But if there ever existed a clay ground in the location specified, it has disappeared and left no trace. Explorations by Lynch in 1847 and Ridgway in 1874 not only found no clay ground, but no trace of smelters, furnaces, or other means of melting and casting brass. The point is of little importance. The pillars and the temple vessels were cast, somewhere, but a failure of fact in a statement so absolute may be an indication of the other one kings and two chronicles statements about the pillars were also inaccurate as to facts. Vide the height statements. The globes celestial and terrestrial, which usually surmount American lodge room pillars, are wholly modern inventions, without a basis in scriptural fact. Somewhere, at some time, some ritual maker confused the spherical form of the chapter with an additional sphere. Desiring to account for it, he drew a map of the world on one and a map of the heavens on the other. But in the Kings and Chronicles accounts, and in Josephus, there are no mentions of celestial and terrestrial globes. All this is more interesting than important. The symbolical meaning of the pillars is the vital matter to Freemasons. In the eyes of critical scholarship, the ancient meaning was of the might and the majesty of deity. From the dawn of religion, the pillar, monolith, or built-up, has played an important part in the worship of the unseen. From the huge boulders of Stonehenge, among which the Druids are supposed to have performed their rites, through East Indian temples, to the religion of ancient Egypt, scholars trace the use of pillars as an essential part of religious worship. Indeed, in Egypt, the obelisk stood for the very presence of the sun god himself. The ancients believed the earth to be flat and that it was supported by two pillars of God, placed at the western entrance of the world as then known. These are now called Gibraltar on the one side and Quater on the other. Some writers have suggested that the pillars represent the masculine and the feminine elements in nature. Others, that they stand for authority of church and state, because on stated occasions the high priest stood before one pillar and the king before the other. Some students think that they allude to the two legendary pillars of Enoch, upon which, tradition informs us, all the wisdom of the ancient world was inscribed in order to preserve it from inundations and conflagrations. William Preston supposed that, by them, Solomon had reference to the pillars of cloud and fire which guided the children of Israel out of the bondage and into the promised land. One authority says a literal translation of their names is, In thee is strength, and it shall be established. And by a natural transposition must thus be expressed, O Lord, thou art almighty, and thy power is established from everlasting to everlasting. Quoting Abingdon again, The fact that each pillar had a particular name further suggests that they were not simply a part of the architectural adornment, but originally bore some analogy to the pillars which, singly or in pairs, formed an important feature of the Semitic sanctuaries. At Melkart's shrine at Tyre, there were, according to Herodotus, two costly obelisks at which Melkart, and probably his wife consort, was worshipped. Two pillars also stood before the temples in Paphos and in Hierapolis. 
Ashurbanipal, on the occasion of his expedition to Egypt and Ethiopia, recounts that part of his spoil included two obelisks high with resplendent plating of fine workmanship, from the threshold of the gate of the temple. Therefore, these pillars at Jerusalem, built like the temple itself by Phoenician workmen, were probably intended to be symbols of the deity. They were an artistic refinement of the mezabah, or stone obelisk, which, at many Israelite sanctuaries, still stood beside the altar in much later days. But it does not necessarily follow that Solomon and his subjects so interpreted the significance of these novel and foreign brass objects. For them, the ark in the oracle seems to have symbolized Jehovah. But is it possible that instead of Jarkin, he, Jehovah, was carved on one pillar by Hiram Abbey and subsequently altered into his name, and Boaz, i.e. in him his strength, may be a later substitution for Tammuz, whose cult was very prevalent in the Semitic world. The entered apprentice, in the process of being passed into the degrees of fellow craft, passes between the pillars. No hint is given that he should pass nearer to one than the other. No suggestion is made that either may work a greater influence than the other. He merely passes between. A deep significance is in this very omission. Masons refer to the promise of God unto David. The interested may read chapter 7 of 2 Samuel and gather that the establishment promised by the Lord was that of a house, a family, a descent of blood from David unto his children and his children's children. Used to blast stumps from fields, dynamite is an aid to the farmer. Used in war, it kills and maims. Fire cooks food and makes steam for engines. Fire also burns houses and destroys forests. But it is not the power, but the use of power, which is good or bad. The truth applies to any power, spiritual, legal, monarchical, political, or personal. Power is without either virtue or vice. The user may use it, for well or ill, as he pleases. Freemasonry passes the brother in the process of becoming a fellow craft between the pillar of strength, power, and the pillar of establishment, choice or control. He is a man now, and no minor or infant. He has grown up, masonically. Before him are spread the two great essentials to all success, all greatness and all happiness. Like any other power, temporal or physical, religious or spiritual, Freemasonry can be used well or ill. Here is the lesson set before the fellow craft. If he, like David, would have his kingdom of Masonic manhood established in strength, he must pass between the pillars with understanding that power without control is useless, and control without power futile. Each is a complement of the other. In the passage between the pillars, the fellow craft not only has his feet set upon the winding stairs, but is given, so he has eyes to see and ears to hear, secret instructions as to how he shall climb those stairs, that he may, indeed, reach the middle chamber. He is to climb by strength, but directed by wisdom. He is to progress by power, but guided by control. He must rise by the might that is in him, but arrive by the wisdom of his heart. So considered, the inaccuracies and misstatements of ritual regarding the pillars become relatively unimportant whether 18 or 35 cubits high, whether cast in one place or another, whether or not surmounted in Solomon's day with globes terrestrial and celestial, matter little. The lesson is there, the meaning of the symbol to be read. The initiate of old saw in the obelisk 
the very spirit of the god he worshipped. The modern Masonic initiate may see in the two pillars the means by which he may travel a little further, a little higher, towards the secret middle chamber of life, in which dwells the unseen presence. For a deep dive into the history, philosophy, and traditions of Freemasonry, subscribe to From the Quarries. You will find hundreds of lectures, presentations, shorts, and other Masonic works written by Freemasons for Freemasons. Visit fromthequarries.com or YouTube at From the Quarries.